Let's now rejoin the conversation for part two of my interview with Professor Jeff Sutcliffe. Um, so what do you think are the, the big recent advances in ATP that gets us to this point where, where we're equipped uh, to use this technology in more practical applications? What's the biggest uh, recent advances in ATP? Well, this is sort of the embarrassing truth. In, in the last 10 years, probably the biggest advances was lots more memory in your laptop. Hardware has made things really possible. If you go back 10 years, we just didn't have enough RAM. And it turns out that to do reasoning, you need lots of memory in your laptop. And new chips have made a lot of things possible. But let's assume that that's not my fault or my, my pleasure, it's the engineers. So there's been advances in automated theorem proving programs. And we see this going on all the time. I don't know if you've read the out of Stanford, there's the AI index. It's just came out, the 2021 AI index that measures technological advances in various fields of artificial intelligence and includes some uh, material that I did with somebody from SRI and Christian Sutner showing how the software has advanced in automated theorem proving over the last 10 years. It's an interesting read if you want to find out. It's from the Human AI Center at Stanford University. Yeah, we'll try to link that down in the description then for our readers. If it's something generally available, we can take care so, of that after we so talk. So what are the advances? So there's software advances, but then sort of in the last five, three to five years, of course, the hot topic is machine learning. Why? It's the answer to all of man's ills and woes. And machine learning could be a bit of a game changer in automated theorem proving. One of the difficulties, or the core two core difficulties in automated theorem proving are, for number one, if you've got a lot of known facts from which you're going to derive conclusions, it turns out that you might only need 1% of those facts. How do you select which facts are relevant for trying to derive a specific type of conclusion? And the second big problem of once you've decided which facts you're going to work with, is what steps of reasoning your software is going to do. And at each point as it goes along, it says, what shall I do next? What shall I do next? And making that decision is very difficult. And indeed, we know from theoretical perspective, kind of impossible. And machine learning has is beginning to prove itself in both of those aspects of automated theorem proving. The selection of which facts are probably or likely to be relevant to some type of conclusion you're trying to derive. And then secondly, helping the theorem proving software that does the reasoning to decide what to do next. And the group in Prague, and I would say an interview with Joseph Irvine might be on your agenda, Adam. They are definitely the leaders in this area. They've been on this with their AI for reasoning uh, project for I think five years now with a bunch of people and they've made great progress along there. So use of machine learning to guide automated theorem proving is in, is a is what is one of the things that might really make theorem proving better. If I, if I can go on, there's a sort of a flip side to this coin. It goes back to what is automated theorem proving used for? You are asking about how businesses use it. Well, we all know that machine learning can do magical things. Face recognition, it's reading our number plates, it's looking for cancers, you know, in breasts or lung cancers using medical imaging in a way that's as effective or in some ways more effective than humans can do these tasks. The unfortunate thing with machine learning, in some sense, it's a little bit black magic-y because the machine learning will say, I detect cancer in the left chest. And it's done that because you've given it thousands or millions of pictures with cancers and no cancers, and it learns through image processing and machine learning in this case, that's, you know, this is probably a cancer. So, you, but you can't tell the patient, well, you've got cancer. And it says, well, how do you know? And you say, well, the computer says so. And you point at your laptop, it's insane. So one of the things that has to be done, and this is, you know, this is a well-known story is you need explainable artificial intelligence. You need to be able to explain why the artificial intelligence tool has made certain recommendations or decisions. And in particular, the machine learning situation is complex because machine learning is very hard to explain. 
if you try to understand what's happening inside a neural network, it's it's tricky. I mean, there is work on this. It's not a lot, but I think there's a an opportunity there for this interaction between machine learning and theorem proving, as well as machine learning helping to guide theorem proving software to choose its known facts and to make decisions as it does its reasoning. There's an opportunity for automated theorem proving to take what comes out of a neural network and use that information to help guide the theorem prover to explain what the neural network has done. It's sort of a parallel operation here that's a symbiotic relationship. And so you might, then the theorem proving will get the results. The theorem prover says, I think the machine learning says, I think there's a cancer. And then the data that comes out of the machine learning, the parameters in the neural network could then be used to guide the theorem prover to do a symbolic argument about that and say a cancer and give us really a text output to the doctor and the patient saying, this is why we think we should take the following course of action. Similarly for cars, air traffic control, machinery, whatever you use it for, you know, legal reasoning. This is why you're not going to get a permit to live in the USA or why you are going to get a permit to live in the USA some kind of. And so it sort of wraps around. So now you're using, you think you're using machine learning to help guide theorem proving, but then you want to understand why the machine learning is guiding the theorem proving, or you can get it out and use theorem proving to explain the machine learning that's guiding the, the, the theorem proving again. And there's a nice little cycle that I think will develop in the future of this interrelationship between machine learning and automated theorem proving. That's the hot business at the moment. And I think will be hot for some years to come until research has got that technology understood. Yeah, that's a really great uh, description. Uh, certainly been my opinion, especially looking at some research in cognitive science, it seems like there are these two different modes of intelligence, uh, you know, human intelligence, where you have a sort of a gut feeling or you match a, a pattern, you have some instinct, you come to a conclusion, and then, then you have to figure out, well, why is that reasonable? And then you use your knowledge or a model about the world to explain, well, I think that's reasonable because of the following you know, chain right. of deductions. And it seems to me it would be very powerful if we could combine these two approaches computationally. We have the tools to do that now. So yeah. it's great that we're, we're thinking along some of the same lines. Yeah, uh, we do have the tools. All we need is research. So for all the viewers out there who are multimillionaires, <laughs> remember www.tptp.org. Donate now. <laughs> Credit cards accepted. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so maybe if we shift gears a little bit, um, another topic that uh, comes up, you know, there's still a, a lot of, I guess, debate or people pursuing different approaches to how, if we are to represent knowledge a bit more explicitly, how do we go about doing that? So there's a lot of work on knowledge graphs. There's the semantic web. Um, semantic networks were a big thing. Uh, really almost 50 years ago. And it seems to me there's a lot of similarities with the, the work that's going on now in knowledge graphs to the, that original idea of a semantic network. Uh, and I, it's not clear to me that a lot of people really understand how is the modern work in automated theorem proving and the knowledge representations, the symbolic logic representations that are typically used in the sort of theorem proving work that you and, and various others of our colleagues do, how is that different uh, from a graph representation or a semantic network or a description logic where you have done uh, uh, some more detailed work yourself? So that's a, uh, this is a nice question. This really harks back to the days of Minsky and McCarthy. And uh, in the history of artificial intelligence, there was this bifurcation of the scruffies and the neeps at some point. And of course, Marvin Minsky was one of the scruffies and John McCarthy and Bob Kowalski and that crowd were the neats, where people had given up on trying to be neat and capture things very precisely in logic, and they decided they would use that you know these semantic nets and frame systems, which were used by early expert systems that you mentioned earlier. So what is the difference? One thing that you could say on the positive side of these scruffy representations, like graphs or semantic nets frames is that they're more tolerant of contradictory facts. And as I, we've spoken about, contradiction is a reality in our world. And 
being able to have structures that can capture information without falling apart because there's a contradiction is important. So there's an upside there. Um, and they somewhat, in some sense, simpler structures. They are structures that don't have any notion of inference or reasoning directly connected to them. And so you have to write algorithms, you know, like a path expansion or a star or something in order to use these structures that represent the world. On the flip side, if you go to the NEATS, which is typically logicians, is that everything's very precise and it turns out as, as a result of that, in fact, it's much harder to capture things about the real world because you've got, you can't get this precision about the real world all the time. You have to kind of somehow try and work it out and it takes too long and you say to heck with it, I'm going to just go off and use a semantic net or a graph representation. And sitting somewhere in the middle between these two are the description logics and semantic web representations that you alluded to, which attempt to sort of keep the formalization of logic and its preciseness, but take have the advantage of being able to capture things in the reality of the real world. Uh, semantic web was, of course, touted to be the next great thing after, this, after the, just the general web that we all use every day. And it hasn't succeeded to the extent that was hoped for. Uh, so Tim Bernays Lee and who was the other guy who I can't remember, who started all of that, had great hopes, but it didn't kind of come to fruition. I think there's space for both in artificial intelligence. We do need scrappy representations. And over time, take those scrappy representations and maybe refine them and whatever's formal in there, capture that in a formalism of logic so you can reason formally. But if you can't, you know, it's better than having nothing. Uh, I would guess, if anybody from the scruffy side of the world listens or watches this video, were well, they going to send me hate emails quite soon? That's my take on it. Yeah, indeed. There, there seems to be uh, certain people get very attached to their representations. Uh, and uh, I find that uh, people that, that uh, start working in graphs have all sorts of reasons why graphs are the, the way to go. Uh, I've had some uh, editions of this channel, some, uh, some episodes where I try to talk about uh, what are the real differences and what are the limitations in graphs. Um, so maybe uh, if viewers uh, want some more detail, they can, I'll pr provide some links to, to some of those older videos that explain this in more detail. I, um, I think you made a nice comment there, Adam, because if you want to know about the, you know, a comparison, somebody who knows both sides of the world, there's not a lot of people because people do seem to go uh, one way or the other and don't know the other side of the story very well. I'm certainly guilty of that myself. Uh, you need to have a very broad perspective of artificial intelligence to understand the benefits of, of either side, the disadvantages of each side and how they could relate to each other. Yeah, and it's always challenging in, in science when you've got a path you're pursuing and you're passionate about uh, to give a fair shake to, to all of the other players that think that the right path forward is uh, a completely different path. It, it, this does feel a little bit like a Middle East politics, doesn't it? <laughs> but politics plays into science too, certainly. <laughs> we'll pause the conversation here and return in our next video for part three of my interview with Professor Jeff Sutcliffe.